when we talk about Anglo-Saxon England, I find we tend to talk about the end of Anglo-Saxon England, as it ended in such bloody and definitive fashion in 1066 with the Norman conquest of England. And while the term Anglo-Saxon England can be slightly inaccurate due to the lack of inclusion of the Norse that settled in the 8th to 10th century, as well as the Romano Britons and Celts that lived in England, I haven't come across a phrase that encompasses all of these groups together as saying Anglo-Briton Celt Dane Saxon England doesn't work. So we will try and think of a term later. The theme of this video is to explore the heritage of Anglo-Saxon England, specifically the buildings, and there's plenty to choose from, but I want to focus on five buildings that retain most, if not all, their original Anglo-Saxon architecture, and because I found the history of these sites fascinating. Our first Anglo-Saxon building is located in the southwest of England at the city of Gloucester, St. Oswald's Priory, and sadly, while there isn't much left of St. Oswald's Priory, the reason I chose this site is because of the significance of the location. The Priory was founded by Ethelfled, Lady of the Mercians, daughter of Alfred the Great, and was her and her husband's Ethelred, Lord of the Mercians, burial site. Their tombs are now lost, along with the saint that was reinterred there, St. Oswald, from the Abingdon Manuscript. 909. Here, St. Oswald's body was brought from Bardney into Mercia. What makes this site so unique, in my opinion, is simply that Ethelfled is mentioned as the founder and she was entombed here. Ethelfled is a special historical figure. She's one of the few women mentioned and heavily involved in the politics of the time, as well as ruling the Kingdom of Mercia after her husband's death in 911 AD. While we can debate on how independent she was alongside her brother, King Edward the Elder, she is no doubt a hugely important figure in early English history, because it's rare a woman is recorded in the annals of her time. She was such a prominent figure that her death is recorded in an Irish annal, the Annals of Ulster. Ethelfled a very famous queen of the Saxons, dies. As for the priory itself, like many over the course of the centuries, parts of the site were altered until its suppression in 1537 on the orders of Henry VIII. What remains today is highlighted on an information board detailing the parts that still stand and from what centuries they were added in. While not as grand as some of the other sites we're going to look at, St. Oswald's Priory is still an important site to visit for those interested in the history of Ethelfled and the Kingdom of Mercia. If you want to visit something grander, Gloucester Cathedral is only a five-minute walk from St. Oswald's Priory. Our next Anglo-Saxon site is located at the village of Deerhurst, again in the county of Gloucestershire, Odder's Chapel, built by Earl Odder and consecrated in 1056. I became enamoured with this chapel when I first came across it on my hunt for Anglo-Saxon sites. Odder's Chapel is a fine example of incredibly late Anglo-Saxon architecture as ten years after the chapel's consecration, the Kingdom of England would be taken over by the Normans. As for the namesake of the building, the chapel was built to commemorate Odder's brother, Alfric, who died in 1053, before the chapel was rediscovered in 1885. The only indication that the chapel existed was from a stone tablet found 
1665, which had inscribed on it in Latin a dedication to Odder's brother, which reads as, Earl Odder had this royal hall built and dedicated in honour of the Holy Trinity for the soul of his brother, Elfric, which left the body in this place. Bishop Aldred dedicated it the second of the Ides of April in the fourteenth year of the reign of Edward, King of the English. The Odder Stone is now on display at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, and a replica stone is now in place of the original. Earl Odder was a powerful figure within King Edward the Confessor's government. His death is recorded in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, detailed in the Worcester Manuscript. This year, Earl Odder passed away, and he lies in Pershaw. He was ordained a monk before his end, a good man, and pure, and very noble, and he departed on 31st August. For the later history of Odder's Chapel, a history of the county of Gloucester, volume 8, states, The earliest manor house of Westminster Abbey Manor may have been contemporary with the church built by Odder in 1056. What is connected now to Odder's Chapel is a 16th century house, as the chapel was converted to serve the connected house before being refurbished back towards its original design after 1885. Visiting the site today, there is a peaceful and calming atmosphere in the chapel, and one thing I noticed while exploring the site was a makeshift shrine where the archway is. In the centre of the chapel, there is a piece that has eroded away, leaving a small ledge, where visitors have placed coins and other small items on it. Perhaps people are still using Odder's Chapel for its original purpose, as people walking around the nearby public footpath along the Seven Way Walk would discover Odder's Chapel. I really enjoyed visiting this chapel, and it's one site to tick off if you want to explore Anglo-Saxon England. And luckily, there's another Anglo-Saxon site that's just a two-minute walk from Odder's Chapel. St. Mary's Priory Church, one exception to the introduction of retaining most of its Anglo-Saxon architecture. St. Mary's is a fantastic site for exploring the developing architecture of churches over the centuries, as it contains designs from various periods. The church from the inside is described in one of our sources titled the Priory Church of St. Mary the Virgin at Deerhurst. Approaching the church from the south, the 14th century and Tudor windows of the nave and south aisle, together with the tall rectangular tower, are strikingly impressive. At first glance, very little Saxon work can be discerned, but closer inspection reveals the telltale bands of harrowing bonework a sure sign of early masonry. The earliest part of the church's masonry is dated from 700 AD onwards, starting at my personal favourite part of the church. The two stone beast heads, located on each side as you enter the main complex of the church. These two animal heads are dated from 900 AD and are beautifully detailed, there is even traces of their original painted colours still remaining. Until the suppression of the abbey, St. Mary's featured wall paintings all over the church. One of our sources, titled Making Much of What Remains, Reconstructing Deerhurst's Anglo-Saxon Paint and Sculpture, states that, sadly, at St. Mary's, the wall plaster was completely removed in 1861, and so no early painted plaster has survived. Almost certainly, however, more of the church interior would have been painted, and it could have perhaps looked a little like the 10th century church 
of St. George in South Germany. There would also have been rich wall hangings and curtains. The next piece of Anglo-Saxon work is this lovely limestone font dated from the 9th century and perhaps the best preserved one of the age. I find the spiral carved design to be absolutely magnificent, a true testament of some of the best work from Anglo-Saxon England, and like the animal heads, the font would have had colour painted onto it. Sadly, the paint has been scrubbed off, but it's still wonderful to look at, especially in person. Back to the architecture of the church. In the northwest part of the church is an exposed wall. This section is dated from the 9th century. The reason for this wall being stripped is due to the Victorians. They had a nasty habit of stripping plaster and paint off churches in order to return them to what they thought was the correct way. Most churches went through some type of Victorian restoration, and St. Mary's was one of them. There's a weird type of hypocrisy with the Victorians. Some of them rally to strip plaster and paint off, but then they try to reimagine or recreate medieval wall paintings. This hypocrisy is on full display at Gloucester Cathedral, with one section stripped bare down to the foundations, and on the other side, there's beautifully painted walls in one of the chapels painted in the 1800s. I've oversimplified it, but going back to St. Mary's, on the west wall of the nave, you can spot a unique double-headed window dated from the 9th century, which was connected to the original Anglo-Saxon tower, which no longer exists, as the tower was remodelled in later centuries. The final two pieces of Anglo-Saxon work at St. Mary's are the Deerhurst Angel and the Virgin Mary carving. The Deerhurst Angel is on the outside of the church. It's located in an obscure section around the back of the church, high on the south wall of the ruined asp. The Deerhurst Angel is difficult to see as it's high up but it is a wonderful piece of history. The guidebook purchasable at the church describes its restoration. In recent years, it was showing signs of deterioration due to acid rain and the pollution of the atmosphere. With the aid of a generous grant from the Friends of Deerhurst Church, this sculpture has been conserved and hopefully the damage arrested. Like most of the Saxon work here, the Deerhurst Angel is dated from the 9th century, and again it would have been painted. An example of how it would have looked in full colour comes from one of our sources, making much of what remains, reconstructing Deerhurst's Anglo-Saxon paint and sculpture by Richard Bryant, which can be brought at the church. And the final Anglo-Saxon piece is the Virgin Mary carving located just above you as you enter the church. Like the others, the paint has been stripped, but not all of it. Some traces can still be seen. This carving is one of the most unique Anglo-Saxon carvings ever found in England, as the design of the carving has Eastern Roman or Byzantine influence. One theory is that the icon was brought from Rome. Quote, the most likely explanation is surely that Ethelric brought an icon back with him when he returned from his pilgrimage to Rome. Ethelric was a nobleman who lived in the kingdom of Wicca. The fourth location is in the county of Wiltshire at Bradford-on-Avon, St. Lawrence's Church, perhaps the finest example of Anglo-Saxon architecture in England. The trustees of the Saxon church describes the site. St. Lawrence's is a characteristic Anglo-Saxon building, tall and narrow with small windows. The extent and richness of its decoration, however, are rare, perhaps suggesting 
it was designed partly for the relics of Ethelred's brother, Edward the Martyr, which were housed with the nuns at Shaftesbury. Some time later, the church, being no longer required, was lost amidst other buildings and only came to be noticed again in the 19th century. When I arrived to film here, I was shocked at how well St. Lawrence's blends in with the other buildings around it. Despite the church potentially being over a thousand years old, as the date of the church might be as early as the 7th century, or at least the 10th century. This is the problem with researching sites like this, as there's plenty of information on when the church was rediscovered, but hardly anything about its foundations. St. Lawrence's has been dated from the reign of Ethelred. William of Malmesbury, an 11th century historian, mentions that the founding saint of the church consecrated the site around the early 7th century. Regardless, it's still an old Anglo-Saxon building. I plan to revisit it once again in the summer. As for its restoration, like some of the others, buildings were added onto it, and before its renovation, the church was part of a school before being restored in the late 1870s to the site we see today. Exploring the church today, you get a real sense of how people from Anglo-Saxon England would have worshipped and just how small the congregation would be, as it's a tight fit through the passageway. The church is still used as a place of worship, our final Anglo-Saxon building is perhaps the most visited one out of the five, as it's located within one of the finest castles in all of England, Dover Castle, the Church of St. Mary. Dover has always been an important area since the time of Roman Britain, as next to the church is the remains of a Roman lighthouse, so a two-for-one in terms of historical adventure. The Anglo-Saxon history of the site is described by one of our sources as There is no documented record of the age of the Church of St. Mary in Castro. Archaeologists have assigned dates to it from the 4th century to the 10th. The large arches in the east and west walls of the tower are constructed of Roman brick and are Roman in character. Whether they were built by the Romans themselves or the Saxons who followed them is open to argument. However, the foundation of the tower are continuous under these arches, as if they had originally been solid, and the arches are generally considered to be Saxon work and probably date from around the 7th century. The layout of the church as it is today was, in the opinion of the Victorian architect, Sir Gilbert Scott, to have been completed at some time before the beginning of the 10th century. Similar to the other sites we've looked at, the history of the Anglo-Saxon part is limited, as the restoration of the church was again during the age of the Victorians in 1860 and you'll notice a theme with each of these sites is that they're tall rather than long. The original Saxon doorway into St. Mary's is blocked off and filled in, but looking across the rest of the church, the design is a fusion of Roman and Saxon, which makes sense as some of the material used was left over from the Romans, whereas the other sites we've looked at don't feature this fusion and given the size of the church, it would have been the central place for the Anglo-Saxon settlement of Dover and the later Burr. I hope you've enjoyed exploring these Anglo-Saxon buildings. In the description tab are links to the sites if you want to explore them yourself, and if you enjoyed the video, consider supporting the channel on Patreon or YouTube channel membership where you can get access to behind the scenes and future updates. Thank you all for watching.